So um, uh, good to be with everyone here today. And I, I want to share um, something, uh, some thoughts that I hope will be provocative um, and really uh, give a different perspective on, on what, uh, what youth can, can and, and may want to uh, really consider as they, they look on how they can have the greatest impact and the most fulfilling lives that they are able to have. The question is, uh, we, we all know that the critical importance of STEM learning today, but STEAM is when we add the arts, and that's a broad definition of the arts. That's a liberal, the entire liberal arts field. So what is the, the value of that addition? It's, it's not principally about just the enjoyment and fulfillment of learning the liberal, liberal arts, but it really is in addition to that about how uh, that can influence uh, your achievements and, and your ability to, to really do important things in society. So here are two different um, uh, surgeons who, who have a great deal in common and maybe one big thing that's different about them. Uh, they're both uh, brilliant, uh, exceptional surgeons. Interestingly, both of them's parents uh, immigrated from India, and then both of them grew up in somewhat rural Ohio and went on to be uh, outstanding surgeons themselves. On the left is Dr. Kumar Palai, who I know very well because he was founder of one of the medtech companies that, that I was CEO of, and he uh, invented a, a new technology for uh, involved in vascular surgery. Uh, excellent innovation. The other is a gentleman named Dr. Atul Gawande, and I'll talk to you more about him later. Um, but in each case, it'll be, I uh, want you to think about um, what might have been the difference between them and how uh, the difference between STEM and STEAM learning and how it affects them. So before going back into them in detail, here are two more guys. On, these are both world-renowned uh, researchers in neural, um, uh, uh, in, in neural research, uh, brain research. Uh, on the right is Dr. Uh, Mark Tessier-Levine, who is now the president of Stanford University. And Mark has, interestingly, as one of the world great researchers in, in uh, neuroscience uh, has come back to Stanford and wanted to reinstill the importance of liberal arts education. Not necessarily what you might think would be the perspective of someone who, um, who is such an outstanding researcher in neuroscience. He became the, uh, the chief scientific officer at Genentech, uh, and then he became president of Rockefeller University and their great uh, medical research before moving on to Stanford. Uh, but, but what is it about Mark that was different? And what, what, um, what similarities does he have with Dr. Uh, Gawande? Well, come to find out, both of them uh, were brilliant students. Mark had said, geez, when he was uh, younger, he was uh, just a math and science whiz. And that's all he focused on, and he just excelled at it. And in his early 20s, he had an opportunity to be a Rhodes Scholar to Oxford University. And he elected to study a combination of philosophy and psychology. Not exactly what you'd expect from a great uh, scientist. Uh, but Mark has said that that one year transformed his life. It was the difference between him becoming a, an excellent researcher and being a world-renowned researcher and becoming a world-renowned scientist uh, versus becoming the president of one of the most prestigious and influential universities on earth. And what that did was he, he attributes it that it caused him to really understand critical thinking and the importance of a breadth of perspective more than just depth of perspective. Certainly both matter. And, uh, and we, to, to be really great achievers in a given field, depth is, is essential. 
but breath is as well. And, um, and that's what caused him to not only, he attributes it to being a, um, a greater scientist, far greater, that he, he would not have been chief scientific officer at Genentech without that perspective. And that was a differentiator of him versus other scientists. Uh, but then to become um, president of a university, which is not where most neuroscientists end up. And, um, and I'll add one other element uh, to Mark. Um, for such a brilliant and accomplished person, he has a real humility. And part of that he attributes to his Canadian background. Culturally, it's, it's a, a bit different from American. They, you know, we, it's hard to tell us apart sometimes by our accents and, and, uh, and, uh, and our, our cultures. But uh, the joke he tells is, um, how do you know the Canadian on the street? And the answer is, he's the one saying thank you to the ATM. So they, um, they really are uh, uh, a more self-effacing culture. And that is another attribute that he brings to his leadership style. But back to um, these two guys. So Dr. Gawande, um, in a, he, on the face of it, he has a great deal in common with uh, Dr. Pillai, but he actually has something uh, uh, that, that drove him in a similar direction to becoming uh, one of the leading thinkers on medical and health practices uh, in the United States and the world. Uh, he's become a, a renowned author uh, in the New Yorker. Um, he has written uh, four really influential books, um, Complications, uh, about how surgeons really learn to be surgeons and, um, and the, the learning curve of, of that entire practice and how to make it better. How do we uh, help surgeons become more effective without, with less harm on patients? Uh, he, he points out that, sadly, for the longest time, uh, surgeons become good surgeons through trial and error on people, uh, which, when we think about it, that's not the best way uh, uh, we want them to learn, especially if we're part of that trial and error process. Um, he actually, by coincidence, I heard about him because someone said when when I was starting to head uh, Dr. Pillai's company, he said, oh, have you read Gawande's article, The Learning Curve? And I said, no, I don't know that. What, what relevance is it? So uh, Dr. Pillai's invention was a safer way to place a central line catheter in not having to go through the jugular subclavian veins, which can have uh, great difficulty in first learning how to do it. You're kind of shooting blind to try and find uh, a large vein in the neck. And, um, and uh, it can have severe complications on people. And he developed a, a much safer way to do that. And the opening line of uh, Dr. Guande's first book is the first time I ever tried to place a central line. And he goes in to explaining that he failed. And he failed the second time. And he nearly failed the third time on a high risk patient. And that was the trial and error that he described. And all all doctors have to learn how to do central lines and they'll tell you. They'll say, oh, I can do it in my sleep. And I say, well, what was the first time you did it? Oh, that was, that was more difficult. I had to, I had to um, have a number of people as guinea pigs before I got good at it. Now, I sure wouldn't want to be that guinea pig. So um, Dr. Gawande went on to uh, write um, uh, another book, Better, and, and another one, The Checklist, which is uh, uh, really become... I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Am I okay? Um, and, um, and then he wrote a, a very important article called The Cost Conundrum in 2009. And it came out in the New Yorker right at the time that Obamacare was being debated. And I read the article and I said, wow, this is the most insightful analysis of why uh, healthcare is so expensive in the United States and often not as effective as we'd expect for how expensive it is. And I, uh, I thought, well, he must be in touch with the Obama White House um, and that he's writing about what they're discussing. Well, it came out later that it was the other way around. Obama read his article and said, holy smokes, everybody in my White House has to read this. This is the most important thing on healthcare reform that I've ever read. 
uh, Warren Buffett did the same thing and ended up hiring uh, Gowandi with uh, Jeff Bezos and Buffett and um, and um, uh, 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 Diamond at, at J.P. Morgan hired him to launch and be CEO of a new innovative health delivery company. But it goes back to what was similar between him and uh, Dr. Levine, uh, President Levine, and it is that he also obtained a Rhodes Scholarship. And what did he choose to study? Philosophy and political science. And it was a profound impact on him becoming a broader and more critical thinker where he re-examines his whole approach to healthcare is, well, why do we do things this way? And how could we do it better? And what is our perspective? And what different perspective could I have that would help me understand? And why are, why are we ignoring certain things that might be staring us in the face? And this entire questioning process and a skill set to be able to communicate to people uh, in, in ways that are beyond merely technically, um, to communicate with their emotions, to do analytical thinking, um, and to uh, really talk about values. So both of these um, incredible scientists um, uh, have uh, uh, gone down different paths, but this importance of the A in STEAM is what really uh, differentiated uh, between four brilliant people, uh, all who had successful careers, and two who are having global impacts. So that's the A in STEAM. And, and if we think about all of um, the elements of uh, liberal arts, uh, there's so much more broad, and this is really worth thinking about, is what are the aspects of learning in liberal arts, and how does this really impact, impact us? And as we look at um, NGN and its purposes, so much of the objectives of, of what uh, the goals are is how do we affect things that really matter beyond the, the just technical solutions. And certainly that expertise in a given area is the tool set that, that uh, you will need to be able to be effective, but it needs this other dimension as well for you to really have the impacts that uh, many of you would hope to have. It changes our worldview. So on the left is the Renaissance worldview where, where uh, everything is in balance. And on the right is the modernist or manner, mannerist worldview where it looks and, and sees disorder in the universe. And these are things that don't have simple solutions. Or, which world do we really face and what one speaks to you the most? And, um, and um, uh, it either way is what challenges you to think about your perspective and, and begin to struggle with, with what is the meaning of why we're here and how can you affect that world in the way that you wish to. So we move in today to uh, a complex world where politics, we appreciate matters so much more in many ways that we had taken for granted. We had taken for granted that democracy was ever enduring in the United States, that it could never be threatened. And that what we have changes depending on political party policies and priorities change. But I think today we, we realize that in our nation and globally, what happens in politics is so profoundly impact, impactful on our personal lives and the, our futures and the future of the world. So my area that I would just like to talk a little bit more about is um, the future of our world and our climate. And um, when we in Palo Alto uh, have been moving forward as global leaders in addressing climate change as a city, uh, we, we became one of the first cities globally to have 100% carbon neutral electricity. And we did that back in 2015. And um, I had the uh, privilege to represent the city at the Paris Climate Accord. And within the Conference of Mayors, uh, one of the things that uh, was really clearly stated by Ban Ki-moon, who was Secretary General of the UN and had a great deal to do with that um, uh, climate, 
this uh, agreement, which was the, the most significant international agreement on the environment in human history, but not significant enough. Um, but cities who led the way became, had become from the early two, uh, 2010s had become models for other cities to say, well, if cities like Palo Alto and others can become 100% carbon neutral and do it at without high costs, why can't we do that? And it had this steamroll impact uh, not just us, but we were amongst those cities that did. This is a wonderful um, video that you can check out online that a group of our teens at Gunn High School created. Uh, it's a rap song on on uh, carbon-free fuel, and it's it's a it just uh, it's a great um, perspective on it. So I, as I mentioned in um, the conference of mayors um, at the uh, Paris Climate Accord, that impact of of uh, cities having that uh, that cascading impact on getting other cities and subnational regions and others to have uh, the focus on climate change really mattered. But today, as we all know, we aren't going far enough fast enough. What was uh, told to us in 2016 was that the right at that time, the scientific community was beginning to recognize that as dire as their warnings were, um, that climate change was appearing to be happening even faster than they uh, feared. Whereas they were being accused of exaggerating it, we now have seen the last three years that uh, the scientific evidence and the, even what we experience day to day is that this is happening faster. And the real hopes that I have now are that your generation is able to have take charge and insist that this threat to all of our future is most of all a threat to your future and your children's future, and that all of the rest of us have an obligation that is more than just doing something. It is to take on this challenge and really address it and overcome it, and we have to commit to doing so on a very broad scale with no time to lose. And up until the youth movement on climate change in just the last few years, many of us were just deeply uh, frustrated and having despair that we just didn't seem to be able to be adequately effective, that things were happening, but we still had too much resistance and we just weren't able to change things. And what we saw right up until the, uh, the pandemic was that the youth movement was taking charge of this discussion. They aren't the ones who yet are, will have all of the scientific solutions. They will in the coming years and decades, but they, they took charge of the political statement and their parents and their grandparents will listen to them. Even parents and grandparents who are not committed to addressing climate change care about their children and their grandchildren. And they will listen to your voices when you really stand up and say, we will not stand for this to happen. So now we have great headwinds um, and we have the global pandemic who, that has taken away uh, the focus of the global society for the moment. But what we've also seen is that uh, in different ways and different degrees of success and failure, the the nations of the world have taken on a massive threat and mobilized their resources and required society to change in ways that nobody would have dreamed a year ago, that we would all go through and have shelter in place and, and um, changes to our economy that are just drastic, whereas addressing climate change actually has the potential to have many economic and health benefits as well as the environmental benefits. We all saw what happened when we were sheltering at home and suddenly the air was clear everywhere until the climate change induced fires in California changed that to the opposite direction. But what it gave me some hope on despite all the incredible challenges we're going through right now is that with a fraction of the commitment that we've had to do to uh, address this pandemic, that hopefully next year we'll, we will be emerging from, 
we could actually resolve the problems of climate change. And I hope that you all will be leaders in driving that transition of the momentum from addressing the pandemic to immediately taking that same energy and moving forward on, on the, the, the global youth movement on climate change and accelerating this change even beyond what we had uh, thought was possible. So those are my thoughts and, um, and I, I certainly want to commend all of you for your commitment to NGN because um, this is how you can have the impacts that we all need. And you're our future, so we're counting on you. Thank you so much for speaking. Uh, fantastic presentation. So now we're gonna open up to Q&A. So our first question for you, uh, Mr. Burt, is how do I get into the political world? How do I make connections in local government if I do not have family involved? So we right now have a local city council election that is very active. Um, and we have a lot of youth who have said, asked that same question and have stepped forward. And they're actually volunteering in city council campaigns. Um, and, um, and they reach out to candidates and say, can I help you? And uh, I don't know any candidate who hasn't said absolutely. And I, I'll tell you, part of the challenge is um, uh, having the, the technology skills and social media um, that uh, your generation is ahead of my generation by far. And you have immediate assets that you can do. And then many of the, the tools are things maybe you haven't used, but you'll be so quick to learn it on the job. And so uh, that's one level at which you can do that as the foothold, the most immediate. And certainly in this pandemic, we're all starting to see how much local government affects our lives in ways that we had just taken for granted before. So um, I, I, I think that find, look at who the candidates are, look for a candidate who, who looks in, uh, appealing to you and reach out to them personally and I suspect you'll, you'll have a favorable response. And if that candidate doesn't respond to you favorably, the next one will. Yeah, um, so our next question was, what is your best? Oh, did I lose you there? Is that me or you? I think you cut out. Um, okay, there we I'll, go. Yeah, I'll go ahead and ask the next question. So the next question that, um, uh, that, that we have is, so how did you get to where you are now in your career? Oh. Um, so I actually, uh, in university, was uh, more interested in breadth than depth. I was a comparative literature major, uh, but I had a business aptitude uh, and uh, knew I needed to have a living of sorts and founded a business um, in, uh, in hardware, high-tech manufacturing. Uh, became deeply involved in environmental policy and manufacturing and our company won a variety of awards in that arena. But then when we finally started having kids uh, here in Palo Alto, uh, I was just pulled into uh, what was founding a neighborhood group and said, geez, I've been involved in all these state and national environmental policy groups, but this is where I live. It's sort of connected with that local government matters theme. And just stepped forward and began, became, became engaged and then was appointed to our planning commission. And then frankly, with running my company, I had to wait nine years before I really had the bandwidth to be able to run for city council and did that. And um, so it's a succession of pursuing things that you care about and, and think um, you can have a favorable impact and help others on. And if you just dive into them, one thing leads to another. It wasn't by a particular design. All right. Um, great. So our next question for you is, so what qualities lead many startups to succeed and even more to fail? Well, certainly one of the um, qualities in a successful uh, startup founder uh, that they've found is more important than any other, interestingly, more important than your knowledge base, than how bright you are, than your connections. Uh, it is your perseverance. That when you set your mind to it, 
the founder, you can't kill him off or her off. They are so determined that they're going to go through it. And we went through this with our business where there were tough times. And to think that you're going to go in business and it will necessarily be a, a success, or if it is a su success, it's one clear path to success. Expect that it will hit hurdles and you will have to figure out how to overcome them. And there will be times where it just doesn't look like you're going to be able to. And you just have to have that determination that you will get through to the other side. And so I'd say that's the most important characteristic. All right, great. So I think our final question for you before we run out of time um, is so, our next question is, so many global politicians, leaders, and people don't believe in global warming. How would you change their minds? Uh, you know, do you think pol the policy approach is the best way to do it? Uh, you think, you know, science is the best way? You think in increasing education is the best way? Like, what's, what's your take on that? I think it's what I was touching on before. Um, there was a great movie in 2010 uh, called Climate Refugees um, that was a, a documentary. And uh, the producers of that film, um, really, they aired it in, um, in uh, con conservative churches in middle America because they thought that that was the audience that they needed to reach. They were the swing voters, essentially, on this. And what they really found is that in, in that conservative environment, um, who were generally climate skeptics, they care about their children and their grandchildren every bit as much as anyone else. And when their kids told them that, no, this is my future, and this is real mom and dad and grandma and grandpa, uh, that had the impact. And so that, again, is the youth voice is the most credible. And the second is the scientific and, and even the military voices they found, that the military has great credibility.